Hello, uh, people watching the recording. Probably said hello to all the people here. Um, I'm David, I'm the coordinator of the Maths Learning Center, and uh, this is a revision seminar for differential equations for engineers at semester one, 2022. And um, well, here we are. We survived the last couple of years and we're doing okay. Uh, and uh, we're preparing for this exam, which is very early in the exam period. And uh, therefore these people have, you all have the, the um, honor of being the first revision seminar of the semester. Um, cool. So I've had some requests. A lot of people want to talk about Fourier things. And so um, I will talk a little bit about that. Um, ground rules, this is your revision seminar. I don't have to do them. Um, I enjoy them, um, but I don't have to. It belongs to you. Um, and you are the people who have sat through all of the materials of this course or whichever bits of it you've actually seen um, or just felt guilty about not sitting through them um, either way. Uh, so you're the people who have been doing this course. I've just been helping you. And so um, if I say something that's different to what one of the people who runs your course is saying, please let me know. At any point, if um, I say something that doesn't make sense, uh, then let me know. Perhaps wait till I finish the sentence because it might make sense after I've finished saying what I want to say. If I write something down like ridiculous, like one plus one equals one, which is my most common mistake that I make, please let me know immediately. Do not wait to the end of the sentence. Interrupt me straight away. Okay, do not wait and for five minutes to tell me that there was a minus sign missing on the previous page. Okay, um, but otherwise feel free to interrupt. Um, so people on the Zoom, um, I will keep an eye on the chat as much as I can. The people here in the lecture theatre can see the chat as well. So um, if uh, they might keep an eye on it for me as well. Um, so just let me know that something's appeared. That, that's, that's your job in here. Um, and if you're in here, stick your hand up or just yell out. Um, yeah, um, I will try and stop every five to 10 minutes to just make space for those sorts of things as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's start with Fourier stuff. And I just realized I never turned the camera on, so it'll take a moment. Not too bad. Maybe a little further away. All right. All right. So, um, cool. Just let me process for a moment. Yeah, I don't like their preliminaries in the notes. I'm going to start somewhere else. So um, I think I've done this in a revision seminar before, but I'm going to do it again. Would someone mind getting up and closing the back door for me? <laughs> okay. All right. So you've seen trig identities before. Um, you've seen something like um, I think that one's correct. Could be wrong. I'm just going to have to check it just a second. Cos of 2x is cos x squared minus sine x squared. Uh, and that's um, that's one minus cos x. No, that's one minus cos x. So I'm going to get two lots of cos x squared minus one. And so if I put this over here, cos x squared, and then I halve both of them. Okay, I was right. <laughs> Okay, so this thing, cos of x all squared, is a function. Um, it's a 
it's a function um, and I you know it uses cos I know what cos is but squaring cos is a little bit of a weird ass thing and it's difficult to tell what it means but I can rewrite it like this and I know what cos of 2x looks like it looks like cos but it happens twice as fast um, and I know what adding one half multiplying it by half will do it'll shrink it down and I know what adding half will do it'll shift it up and so this tells me that this function, which um, might be a little difficult to tell what it looks like from the way its formula is, is actually this, which is much easier to tell what it looks like. It looks like this. So cos of x would normally be um, here, and cos of 2x happens twice as fast. Um, so normally cos would take, would take 2 pi to get back to this spot, but cos of 2x it only takes pi to get that because it happens twice, as, twice the speed. Um, and it's only half as high, so instead of being from minus one to one, it's from minus a half to plus a half. And when we add a half, we'll get this. And this distance is pi here. Right. And just to be sure that it looks like what cos squared should look like, um, cos is one um, when x is zero, and so one squared is one. And over here um, at pi on two, cos is zero, so cos squared will be zero. Um, and then over here, cos is negative, so when you square it will become positive again. And so it, it's doing the thing that cos squared should do. So that's a trig identity. Um, and what this trig identity has managed to do is to write a function which we know repeats itself every pi on two um, in terms of some other functions that repeat themselves. And that um, is the point of Fourier series, to write functions that we know repeat themselves, so periodic functions, in terms of sines and cosers. That's the point. All right. So we can do that with trig identities. So, you know, I could, for example, figure out what cos of x cubed was, and I could do all this sort of crap, right, and do lots of work and get to an answer at the end, um, which would be based on some a few small causes, um, possibly signs, probably causes, um, and it should exist, such a formula. Um, I know what, and well, I guess I've got like, this is a, cos x squared times cos x, which is a half plus a half of cos of 2x times cos of x, which is a half of cos of x plus a half of cos of 2x times cos of x. And then this thing, cos of 2x times cos of x. I should use some sort of fabulous trig identity to turn that into something else. Um, I know a trig identity is got cos of two different angles. It's this one, cos of two x plus x uh, will be cos of two x cos of x minus sine of two x sine of x. That's the angle addition formula. I don't know if it's important to know that um, in this course, but it's a good thing in your life to know. Um, and cos of 2x minus x is cos of 2x cos of x plus sine of 2x sine of x. And so if I add them together, uh, the signs will cancel out and I'll get uh, cos of 3x plus cos of x is the same as two lots of cos of 2x cos of x. And yay, I have managed to turn um, this bit into something involving cos of x and cos of 3x. And so I can sub that in over here. Um, this may feel slightly like a waste of time if I'm about to talk about um, Fourier series, but what I'm trying to point out to you is that this is an existing thing that we're trying to find a better way to do. And so I've got that. Cos x plus a half of a half of cos of three x plus a half of 
cos of x. So I've got a half and a quarter of cos of x. So I've got three quarters of cos of x plus a quarter of cos of 3x. That's so cool. All right, that's what cos cubed does. What is? Um, so um, this thing here is a Fourier series. When I write a function, which is... Um, which I know is periodic already, in terms of causes and or signs, it's called making a Fourier series. I've written this one in terms of cos x and cos of 3x. It's missed out on the constant um, and the cos of 2x, that's okay. Um, this is a Fourier series. So what I would normally call this, I've got zero plus three quarters of cos x plus zero lots of sine, oh, sorry, cos, of 2x plus one quarter of cos of 3x. And so in the list, what we normally do is we call this thing just here a naught, and this number here a one, and this number here a two, and this number here a three. If we were doing it with signs, we normally call them Bs because, well, it's the next available letter. And they're in alphabetical order, right? Cos and sine, the, the uh, cos is before sine, the alphabet A before B. So you try and match them up so that you feel like everything's connected and, and aesthetic. Okay, and stop at this point. For space, for someone to say something if they would like, or otherwise just for me to not talk for 30 seconds. Radio. Okay. So what we've done so far is I've just, I've got some special ones. It's not always squared. I could do anything I wanted. I can make some random function that I know is periodic and making it out of sine and cos is not the worst thing. And I should be able to write it in terms um, of causes and or signs. Okay. And that's what a Fourier series is. And so you're going to take your function and you're going to write it as possibly a constant like this one ended up with. Two X plus a three cos of three X and also plus B one sine of X plus B two sine of two X, et cetera, forever. That's a Fourier series. Okay. Now we can fix this a little. Um, these Fourier series are guaranteed to have period two pi. Um, all of these original functions, cos of x has period two pi. A constant's not gonna change the period. Um, sine of x has period two pi. Cos of two x technically has period pi, um, but if you look at 2 pi, it will still repeat the whole thing every 2 pi. It repeats it every pi, it just, but you can, whatever is in the space of 2 pi will be repeated. Uh, so that turned up in one of the Mobiuses. It was called a, did they call it a fundamental period? Fundamental, was that the word? Yeah. So the fundamental period is the shortest distance you need to find the piece that repeats over and over. But you can make that distance bigger if you want. You can make it twice as big and it's still a period. It's just not the shortest one. So that's the difference. Was it called fundamental? Yeah, I think. Period. Okay. So we can adjust this to make something that has a different period. Um, any function if you um, replace x with number times x, it will shrink it in by dividing by that number. Um, and so the current period is two pi. And so if we multiply by two pi, um, everything um, will become shorter. I'm just gonna check something. Just give me a minute. One of the tricky things about doing things with revision seminars is I have the whole course behind me. And so I need to think ahead to where we're going.
There's a thing with L's in it. Just a moment. Oh, there it is, n pi on L. In fact, there's not a two in that, it's too freaking me out, so. Oh, it's okay, I get it. All right. Okay, so we're imagining with this is this belongs to functions that repeat themselves every two pi. And it doesn't matter what they look like in here, or well, they will not look like that because that's not a function. But, um, but um, as long as the same thing repeats over and over, every two pi, that'll work with this. Okay, so normally we write this as an infinite sum. We go something like, um, I think they normally write it like this. Like that. But you can do it as two infinite sums separately, one for the causes and one for the signs if you like. Um, but this is, Less some signs, I guess. Um, all right. Cool. So if your function doesn't have period 2 pi but has some other period, then you're going to have to change these so that they have the matching period. Because putting signs and causes together is only capable of producing functions that have period 2 pi. Because all of these functions have period 2 pi. So if you want the period to be something else, if it's not 2 pi but it's instead 2L, then what we'd have to do is we'd have to replace all these x's with two pi in order to cancel out, in order to shrink it down to one and divide by L, which would stretch it out to L. So we'll go the two pi there and then divide by two L. And luckily the twos cancel and we're all happy again. And that's why you get an n pi on L and uh, because we are treating the L as a replacement for the number pi. It's only, L is only half the period. Took me a couple of years to figure that one out. Um, Cause I'm not in the lectures, right? Just helping people in the, le in the math learning center. Um, okay. So this is a Fourier series with a different period. Okay, doing okay? Right. Doing okay. I haven't yet told you how to figure out what one of these Fourier series is. The only tool, I mean, you guys have been given a tool, but let's imagining that I'm teaching this course to you for the, you know, as one of the lecturers, which I am not, but, you know, I could, no, I wouldn't do that. It's much more fun in the Mass Learning Center than teaching actual courses. Um, <laughs> I joke every so often. I'm doing 12 revision seminars this semester. That's 12 different courses. Most uh, university lecturers only do two courses a semester. So, um, but this is much more fun because I don't have to mark the exams. So <laughs> I'd actually get to see the exams ever. Um, if you ever want to come and tell me what was in them, then I, I love to know, but I don't get to see them. Um, yeah. So, um, cool. But here's the problem there aren't very many periodic functions in the world. You know, I mean, I guess if you're in electronics and you've got like a, like a 
the signal that's coming down your wire, it probably is um, periodic. It repeats itself every little while. And that little while is actually like, you know, in the realm of nanoseconds probably. Um, but, you know, most functions aren't periodic. But luckily, most functions actually don't exist on the entire real line. They only exist on a little bit. So in um, differential equations, it is extremely common to have functions that only exist in a zone. There's nothing here and there's nothing here. Because it's like, it's like, I've got a bar that I'm heating and it's only this long. Um, or I've got a pool with waves in it and it's only this wide um, or whatever. Um, or I've got a population of individuals and I'm not going to measure it in terms of how many there really are. I'm just going to do it as percentages. So it only goes from zero to 100. Um, classic. Okay. So since a lot of the functions that we deal with in differential equations only exist in a certain zone and it looks like whatever the hell it looks like, I can pretend that in this bit here that I don't care about, that it's periodic. I can go, I only want this bit, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that in all these places that I don't care about, that it's periodic. Because really, it doesn't matter what it does over there. Because I don't care. I'm only looking at this bit. And this is called a periodic extension of your function. Um, they seem to go on about periodic extensions in the Mobiuses quite a lot. I feel like it's just a weird obsession, right? Because you don't care what happens over there. But it is important to realise that most of the results from differential equations that come from Fourier series only apply in the zone you've got and you can't extend it out because you don't actually know what's going on out there. And what you've implicitly done by doing a Fourier series is pretend that the zone outside here is the same as the one in here, that it's periodic. All right, I'm gonna stop there for a moment. At this point, it would be good for someone to ask a question or make a comment. You don't have to. Cool. Okay. All right. So, um, it is tradition in almost all differential equations um, to the zone you're looking at to call this end zero and this end L on your x-axis or t-axis or whatever the axis is. Because you get to choose your coordinate system, it's a very physics thing to do to choose your own coordinate system. You know, it doesn't, the number doesn't, the bar that you're measuring doesn't have numbers written on it. And so you get to choose that the, this end is zero and this end is however long the bar is. And so what you decide is actually not to copy this bit, but to do this thing. All right, just i going to pause for a second. It's important to notice the fundamental difference between sine and cos. Cos x looks like this. And sine x looks like this. This is an even function. And this is an odd function. And an even function, this is what the even function looks like. This side is the same as this side. And an odd function, this side is the same as this side. You have to rotate it around. Um, like You have to like do that. And then it turns out to be the same. So in an odd function, this thing gets rotated around here like that. That's what an odd function looks like in a graph. Um, but the algebra version of being even and odd 
is the fact that cos of minus x, when you put in a negative number here. Yeah, thank you. Got too enthusiastic. I haven't broken one yet, but you know, first time for everything. Um, cos algebra version is that when you sub in a minus for an even function, um, it's the same as not having a minus. So it just wipes out the minus and you get the same answer. So cos of minus three is the same as cos of plus three. Cos of minus 0 0.83 is the same as cos of 0 0.83. But with an odd function, when you put a minus in, it comes out the front. In your notes, they probably define an odd function as something that where f of x is minus f of minus x. I find that thoroughly confusing. It's true, but I find this more helpful. That an odd function, when you sub a minus in, it's the same as not having the minus and doing the minus afterwards. Odd function minus before is the same as minus after. Um, even function minus before is the same as not having a minus at all. Okay. Now here's the thing. If you make a function entirely out of cos and cos of 2x and cos of 3x, it's going to be an even function. Because when you add two even functions together, you get a new even function. When you add two odd functions together, you get a new odd function. So if you're going to make something entirely out of sines and coses, if you only use coses, it's going to be even. If you only use sines, it's going to be odd. And uh, just so you know, <clears throat> cos and sine are in alphabetical order, and so are even and odd. In case you're wondering and want some, in case you're wondering for something that might help you remember, and it always helped me. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yay. Um, doesn't work in French because they have different names for all of these things, but it works in English. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Okay. So what that means is if I have a function that isn't actually defined anywhere outside a certain zone, and I want to write it as a Fourier series, I can make my life easier by extending it in such a way that it's an odd function or extending it in such a way that it's an even function. I'm not really extending it. That function is not really there outside this zone, but I can imagine that it is. So what this means is that any function that's only defined on a certain domain, I can do it as a Fourier series made entirely of causes, or I can do it as a Fourier series made entirely of signs because I get to choose what I imagine the rest of this function looks like. So I can either, I'm just going to try and um, copy that same thing. I can either decide that I want the function to be even, or I can decide that I want the function to be odd. And then after I've done this, then I decide that this entire shape repeats itself over and over and over. Or I decide that this entire shape repeats itself over and over. And so there's two layers of extending when you want to extend it to be odd or even. This is my original. And first I extended it one way to make it even. And then I copied that whole thing over and over and made it periodic. Or I extended it a different one way in a different way to make it odd. And then I copied that whole thing. So that's the two levels of doing odd and even extensions. But technically, people seem to care. I don't care. Um, technically, you're not doing any of that because none of this really exists. You only care about this bit just here. But the point of it is that if you wanted to extend beyond, it would extend in a different way if you use sines versus causes. So if you did this, then I could do a thing made entirely of causes, a naught plus a one cos of x, and well, the sum of a n cos of n x. And this one would be the sum of Bn sine of Nx, 
or n pi on l, right? All right. Um, I would like someone to, I'm going to write them better. I would like someone to please say something about how these are different. Ah, you're saying B naught is zero. This is a very important thing. There, in fact, is no B naught. But if there was a B naught, it would be zero. <laughs> um, so why is that? So you're saying sine would go through this point? Like, is that what you said? It would go through zero on the, on the y-axis just here? This is zero, zero? So if it was a sine, it'd be like that. And if it was sine of 2x, it would be like that. And they'd all go through this point. Um, and the other one is that you can't shift a function up and have it be odd because it has to rotate around here and be the same on both sides. So an odd function has to pass through zero, zero. And so we can't have a plus a constant because that means it wouldn't pass through zero, zero anymore. Thank you. That was what I was hoping people would say. <sighs> okay. Um, so, and that's because of the oddness. Um, an odd function can't have a plus constant on the end. If you want it to be odd, it won't be odd anymore. It'll be neither odd nor even usually because there are many functions that are neither. And the world is sad that way. Um, but luckily, most functions we care about in differential equations only exist this much, so we can pretend they're odd or pretend they're even. We can even pretend it's odd even if it doesn't go through zero by just declaring that the value of it, if, even if it does this, right? Even if your function does this, you just... That was bad. What? Yeah, there we go. Um, you just declare that the answer here is zero and that it's got open circles at these places here. So that's fun. Okay. Right, so this, just, just where have we been? Just a second. We want to write functions in terms of signs and causes because we understand a lot about how signs and causes behave. Um, and we can do it with trig functions by using trig identities. Um, and that's what motivates us to believe that it might be possible. Um, but we can actually do it with any function as long as we use infinitely many signs and causes. If it's a trig function already, it'll only use like two or three of them, and then you'll, you'll just stop and that's fine. It's still a Fourier series if it doesn't go forever. But if it's not a trig function, it's going to take infinitely many of them um, to join together. Okay. Um, and you can choose if you've got a function that's only on a certain zone to do it with only causes or do it with only signs. You can also choose it to do it with the combinations of causes and signs if you want, but who wants to? Okay. Uh, what I have not done is the important moment of how do you figure out what the coefficients are? All right. Um, this is a story we've told before. We have told a story of rewriting functions in terms of other functions, and that was when we did Taylor series. Taylor series is a function written as a polynomial, but we have to use infinitely many terms. So we write it in terms of x and x squared and x cubed and whatever. And that's actually odd and even functions as well. x squared and x to the power of four and x to the power of six, they're all even. And x cubed and x to the power of five and x to the power of seven, they're all odd. That's why they have the name even and odd because the even powers are even, and the odd powers are odd. Um, 
So we've done that before. And the way that we figured out those coefficients was using derivatives. We're not going to do it today. We're going to use, for you, instead of figuring out with derivatives, we're going to figure them out with integrals. And we've also told this story before in Mass 1B Algebra, where we had vectors and we want to write them in terms of other vectors. This vector is A plus this basis vector plus B for times this basis vector plus C times this basis vector. And to figure out what those A, Bs and Cs are, we had to do like row operations. Or if we were very lucky, our basis was an orthonormal basis and we could figure out what those, vec those numbers were using dot products. So when you do a dot product, you multiply the matching pieces. Just a second, ready, 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 here we go. All right, well, even before that, sorry. So back in Mass 1B, um, or wherever you came from before you did this course, um, back in Mass 1B um, algebra, we had like a vector and we wanted to write it as uh, a combination of a, an orthonormal basis, how many there are. And what we discovered was it had to be some number times each of these things. And the correct number to go here was V dot U, one. And the correct number to go here was v dot u2. And the correct number to go here was v dot u3. That was orthonormal basis using dot products. Right. What we want is to have a function and to write it as something times um, sine of x and something times sine of 2x and so on. The correct number to go here, maybe it's some sort of dot product. It's the same shape, what I'm doing. If I could find a way to define what the dot product meant for, vec for functions, I could do it. All right, so here we go. Dot product of vectors, if you've got two vectors and they've got coordinates, right? then what you do is you take the coordinates in matching spots and you multiply them and then you add it up. So I've got two functions. Then the matching spots are the X coordinates. And I wanna multiply the matching values, which is the function values. And I wanna add them up and adding up with functions is integrals. That's the coolest thing ever. Well, since the last time I said that, you know, if you've ever been in the Mass Learning Centre for any length of time, every so often you'll hear me say, that's so cool. Um, yeah, so this is the coolest thing today so far. Um, right. Okay, so what that means is if I want to write something as a, as a sum of all these signs and causes, I need to use dot products, which is integrals. Um, but it only works, this dot product rule only worked if the length of this vector was one. And it only worked if these vectors were orthogonal to each other, meaning that their dot products were zero. So if I'm gonna do this, I need to be sure that when I do this integral dot producty thing with these two functions, it's gonna come out to zero. And magically, it does. So the world is a good place. Problem is that the, all right. Okay, so here we go. There's a theorem which says that the integral from minus pi to pi of cos of nx times sine of nx is zero. And this is the dot product. This thing is the dot product of cos of nx and sine of nx. That's what this thing is because I've taken across all of the values where, because it repeats itself every two pi, so I can, I can not worry about this. I can dot product it with this and this, and when I, which is the same as multiplying the matching entries and adding them up, and that dot product is zero. And there's a theorem that says that um, if you have two different answers, no, cause, 
where n and m are different whole numbers, then that's zero as well. And if they're both signs, the answer is zero as well. Um, and if you have the number one, uh, which is the constant, comes out to zero as well. And so when I take the whole list of things that I could possibly put, Um, as these pieces just here, they're all orthogonal to each other. So yay, that's the theory. The theory says that these functions are all orthogonal to each other, and therefore I can use the dot product in this spot, uh, except it technically only works if your function has length one. And if it's not length one, you're gonna to have to divide by the square of the length, but that's okay. The square of the length is um, the length of sine of nx squared um, is the integral from minus pi to pi of the dot product of it with itself. And uh, if you watch very closely, you can discover that this um, sine squared looks like that um, and the total area from here to here um, under here that bit neatly fits into there when you rotate it around and so you get one high and l wide and, and pi wide which is just the coolest and so this length is pi which is just so just i love it so much and so it turns out that all of this theory goes together and produces, produces that the coefficient of um, cos of nx, so that's what the a n is, is going to be the dot product of your function with cos of nx, but divided by the length of cos of nx squared, which is pi. Let me just check. Have I got my have I got my formula right? This is why we have two sheets. Yes, I was right. But we don't really normally do it with this one. It's actually usually n pi on l like that, and we want to divide it by, we want to go from minus L to L, and we want to divide it by the length of that, which is L. So that's that version. Cool bananas. And then the A0, which is the constant term, which is the coefficient of one, because it's how many ones there are at the front, like a naught times one, that'll be the integral from minus L to L of F of X times one DX. But I'll have to divide by the length of one, which is this air, the area under one from here to here, squared, like the area of one squared from here to here, which is actually 2L, because it's L wide and one high and there's two of them, so. And that is why the formula for A naught is different to the formula for all the others. Because when I do the integral of this thing squared, I've only got something like that, and it's only half the area, um, yeah. And the BN is the coefficient of sine of nx, and that is the same thing, but with a sine. Sine of n pi on lx, sorry. Okay, would anyone like to say something at this point? Or ask something? Yeah. 
You mean um, like over here? Yeah. Right. That's the magic trick. The magic trick is that when you want to write this as A0 plus A1, I just want to be absolutely certain I understand what you're talking about here. So it'll be one pi. I should just put the sum, sum sign in, sorry. That's just better. Okay. If you want to write it like this, like this, then the magic, it's not magic, it's maths, which is better. Um, the magic trick that we use to figure out what the correct number that goes in this spot is, is to perform, sorry, the correct number to go in this spot is to perform this integral and that answer is the number I, I need. And it has to be different f, f of, different f of x's will have different numbers in these spots. And so the way that I calculate what bn is has to be based on what f of x is. And so the f of x must appear in the formula for what bn is because it has to be different for different f of x's. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right. So I would like to point something out here. You may have noticed that the diagrams I'm drawing here go from minus L to L. But most of the time, the function you're looking at only goes from zero to L. What do we do about that? Yep. Yep, double everything. That's, that's, that's the answer. Um, all of the areas, because I'm making even or odd functions, will be twice as much. Magic. Um, so actually, most of the time what happens is you're only looking at the space from zero to L, and we can either write it as And so you've got A naught is, we really want the integral from minus L to L, 1 over 2L of F of X times 1 DX. That's what you want for the constant term. Um, but we're just going to do the integral from 0 to L and do twice as much. Because if I times this by 2, um, the 2's cancel. And for A1, we're, we're going to do 1 on L and we're just going to do the integral from 0 to L and we'll do twice as much because it'll come out to the same answer because the integral I want, well, the function I'm going to do is the same on this side compared to that side and so the area is going to be twice as much. And it even, strangely, works with the sign, because even though technically the integral of an odd function, the negative bit cancels out the positive bit, and you'd expect the answer to be zero if you went from minus L to L. But I'm timesing, and F is also be pretending to be odd in this bit, so when one of them's negative, the other one's negative as well, and those two negatives cancel each other out and make it positive. Which is just, it's just so cool. So the reason I tell you all of this is that there are many people for whom without these connections, they can't remember any of it. Now you do have cheat sheets and, and formula sheets. You have cheat sheets, right, this year? Yeah. Um, people who are watching in future years, they have changed the rules of what's allowed in the exam every year for the past several years. So in 2023 and beyond, it might not be true that you get a cheat sheet, so please don't take my word for it from past David. Check in your own exam thing this year. Okay. Just that's my disclaimer. <laughs> um, battery's not included. Um, we, uh, yeah, that's why we have cheat sheets to look at the details. But if you know what you're looking for, then it's easier to find it on your cheat sheet. Um, and sometimes it's easier to have a shape in your mind that you can write down 
and just look up the details and go, I can never remember if it's a two or not. Um, that's how my memory works anyway. Um, so, yeah. But for me, if I have to remember this, I remember the minus L to L and then I do the zero to L and times by two. That's the one that makes sense to me. Cool. But final, final thing. Now it's going to stop there before I do the final thing. Thoughts? Questions? All right. All right, final, final thing. Why do we care so much about these things? You know, it's fun writing functions as, as you know, Fourier series if we want, you know, and I can do those integrals as, and probably integration by parts and all sorts of fun. Um, but why? Would you want to do that? I mean, if it's okay to just do it because you think it's fun, but you know, I, I wouldn't expect to examine people on things that I think are fun. Um, so I think the reason is that certain methods of solving differential equations tend to produce Fourier series, or at least unknown Fourier series. So when you do your PDEs, I'm not going to do the whole process right here at the moment. Something like that. That's a classic, isn't it? That's one of the classics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dx on dx would be zero. <laughs> dx on dx would be one. Or a phi or a capital T or whatever. Um, and sometimes it's not a d u on dt d squared u on dt squared. Sometimes it's d u on dt. It's all these variations. Um, the way of solving it has the tendency to produce an infinite sum of pieces. So what you do is you imagine that u is a function of x and a function of t. And sometimes they use capital X, don't they, and capital T for those things so that we don't lose track, which I think is really quite a friendly thing to do. Over in the um, differential equations for maths courses, they don't do that. And um, it's not as easy to keep track. So, because I, I would prefer the G went with the X and the F went with the T because then they're in alphabetical order, but whatever. Um, so, when you do this, you don't actually find that u is a function of x times a function of t. You find that there are all these different options for what you could have been that are all function of x times function of t. So when you do this whole process, you find that it could be that it's... I don't have any finished examples off the top of my head, um, but you find it's something like... probably a nine, probably. Anyway, you put a number here, cos of number x um, times e to the minus something x or something, a t, something like that. Um, and then there'll be another option that would be cos with a different number times x times e with a different number times t. And you get all these infinitely many different options for what you could have been that are each of them something involving x times something involving t. And then what you say is, that u is actually, these are all the options of what u could have been, and it's not any one of them, it's all of them. You say, oh, well, this will be u1, and this will be u2, and then my actual answer for u will be some constant times this plus some constant times this plus plus forever. That's how we do this process. Um, and what happens is, that if you sub in a value for t, you get a series of causes all added together, which is a Fourier series. That's why the Fourier series is so important, because this method of solving differential equations, which 
I don't know who invented it, but they were thinking very clearly that day, probably that years and decades, took people a long time to figure these things out. That's why, because we've done the same trick again. Over here with the Fourier series, we've said, oh, there's all these functions, and I'm going to write my function as something times this one plus something times this one plus something times this one. Same deal here. I've got all these solutions that are possible, and I'm going to write the final answer as something times this one plus something times this one plus something times this one. And this is called the superposition principle. Um, and the superposition, superposition principle is borrowed terminology from wave theory where you have two waves traveling through a medium and they travel on top of each other and they add up. They super meaning on top of and position meaning place. They're on top of each other's places. Yeah. But really in math just means add them together. Thoughts, questions? Okay, so, um, right, cool. Would anyone like me to talk more about this thing in more detail? And I have give you another option, which is not necessarily separate. I've got a whole hour, right? It is two o'clock, right. Um, would you like me to talk about some of the problems that came up in the course that are related to this Fourier series -y thing. So feel free to answer that question in whatever you like, way you like, or answer a different question that I didn't ask. What do you want me to talk about? Is the next question. Feel free to think about it. Bit. Transforms. Transforms. Okay. Cool. All right, so I'll skip score for your transforms in a second. Remind me if I forget, but I do want to do something that someone sent me online, which was in one of the Mobiuses recently. Um, I just want to talk about it for a moment. Um, I don't have the preceding answers, but I just wanted to point something out. So one of the Mobiuses went, I really shouldn't have been that explicit that it was a Mobius and hopefully the future that they change them, but what is? So it had this and then it had this as the conditions and these are both equal to zero. I'm not going to solve the whole thing, it takes pages. So I don't want to do that, but I just want to point a couple of things out. The first thing that's annoying is they've used capital T as where I'd normally put a U, which means I can't use capital T here when I do the solution, which is just annoying because this is a different function than that one. So I hate them for that. That's nothing I can do about that. Um, and this is telling me that D capital T on DX is zero for all time. And therefore, um, when I split it into pieces, I shall call it U of T because it's the next available letter. Is that a bad move? Doesn't matter. Um, this is telling me that T sub X of X T is x dash x u of t. Um, and that's zero no matter what t is, and so therefore x dash x is zero. That's for pushing forwards into the Sturm Louisville problem, which I can come back to, but I you want to talk about Fourier transforms. So I'll get back to that in a second. So that's that, but that's not what I talk about. What I want to talk about is the fact that the question asked us. Find t of x t as t goes to infinity. 
if t of x zero and then find the limit as t goes to infinity of t of x t. So when you do this process, you run through the whole thing um, and unhelpfully in this uh, Mobius, you actually had to start from scratch. You couldn't use part A, part B was just, you had to start from the beginning again and um, everyone's heart sank when they're in the math learning center and they'd already done six pages of work for part A and went, all right, so how do we do part B? Oh, we have to start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. So that's how we all felt at the time. Um, and if you ever want to give advice to first year students um, when they're coming in, when they're in second year and you're in third year and you want to give them advice about this course, you can say the Mobiuses are large. They may only have three questions, but don't let that fool you. Um, okay. So um, what happens is, is that you do get T of XT equals something. Um, and you'll get like an, an A naught um, and you get this Fourier series and you get um, E to the something T and a cos of something X, something like that. Um, and what happened was that It was a minus t. And so the limit as t goes to infinity of t of x t, because that e to the minus t is there, this limit is zero as t goes to infinity. And so we end up with a naught. And this was a sneaky trick. Um, because what that tells us uh, is that this limit is the same as this coefficient. And if I did T of X zero, it would be A naught plus, oh, there were ANs here as well. E to the zero is one. That that's a Fourier series. So I've done two things. I've subbed in zero so that I can compare to this. And I've done the limit as t goes to infinity so I can compare to this. And the limit as t goes to infinity was this number. And this number is the constant term in the Fourier series. And so this is a Fourier series cos series for this function. And the constant term in a Fourier cos series is uh, zero to L, so minus L to L of F of X times one DX, um, but it's not, but it's only defined for half of it. So I'll multiply everything by two and my L was 12. And so I sub that function in there and I find its integral and divide by 12, and that is the answer for A naught, which is therefore the answer for the limit. Yay. All right. If I can look up the time frame of this, I will put that time frame in the thing, and next year I will say to people, oh, I talked about that in this video. Um, yeah. I am just going to pause the recording for just a moment. Um, uh, one last thing to say, which is in this question, we had to do an integral to figure out what the appropriate coefficient was, but it is very common in these sorts of questions to not have to do any integrals to figure out what the coefficients are, because what you, the function you've got is already a Fourier series. So if you had discovered that you, your u of x and t, I did. Just let me check. Yes. Okay. Um,
All right. If you had discovered, if you had discovered um, that your function was um, normally they'd end up be capital letters when you do this. If you had discovered that your function was this, damn it, David, just sharpen your pencil. Honestly. Right, I'm just going to start that again. If you had discovered that your U was this, and that wouldn't be a zero, that would be a one. Uh, maybe there'll be like an N here. Suppose you had discovered that and you were told that U of X zero um, was this, then you would know um, that, so suppose you had this information, so this was what you figured out, but then you had this one last piece of information here, then you would know that from the formula you figured out, u of x zero would be a naught plus n equals one to infinity, a one e to the zero cos of nx, and e to the zero is one, and this is a Fourier series. And this is a Fourier series as well. It's just most of the a's are zero. And so you could say that therefore this is a Fourier series, this is a Fourier series. If a function has a Fourier series, it's only got one. And so therefore a three, is one because it's the coefficient of cos of 3x and a7 is phi because it's the coefficient of cos of 7x and all the other a's are zero. And so therefore, when I go back to the original function, the a naught isn't there because we've discovered it's zero. Um, the A3 is there, and so I'm going to get 1 e to the minus 3 squared t cos of 3x. Um, plus the A7 is there, e to the minus 7 squared t cos of 7x, and that is the final answer. So you don't have to do any integrals you can just match up the coefficients of cos or sine depending on which one you've made. Um, sometimes there's another bit of numbers floating around here and sometimes you have to differentiate it first to get to match it up with this because it's actually not ux0 but it's ux x0 or something. Uh, UT. How do people feel about that? Cool. Just want to mention it. Someone emailed me and said, can you talk about going straight to the Fourier coefficients without doing any calculations? So just want to point that out. So there are some times we have to do a little calculation to rearrange it because you end up with, there's like a, co uh, like a four, an N here as well. And so you actually get three a three equals one or something like that. Yep. So how would this be like a whole a? Because well, I'm just going to step that through here. This is a Fourier series, yeah. and so is this. And a naught is the constant term. There is no constant term here, so a naught is zero. A one is the coefficient of sine cos of one x. And there is no cos of 1x. And so a1 is 0. 
and A2 is the coefficient of cos of 2x, and there is no cos of 2x, and so A2 is 0. And A3 is the coefficient of cos of 3x, and there is 1, so A3 is 1. And so it's because cos of nx doesn't appear in the formula for any other n. Is that a, how do you feel about that? Yeah. Really important question. <laughs> um, in exams, it's rare for them to have any more than two of them in this function. It's actually really common for them to have a constant plus a cos of something x. So. Yes. Um, but just don't be fooled. There are there have been times where they've had a cos series here and they've had a sine here, and you actually would have to do integrals then. Because um, you you can write just a piece of sine in terms of cos if you've got infinitely many of them. Because yeah, anyway, that's a whole other technical detail we can talk about another time. All right. It would be nice to say that the Fourier transform is closely related to the Fourier series. And I think theoretically it is, but it just does not feel like that. Um, there you go. So I'm just going to have a quick look at the notes on Fourier transforms. I did worry that someone was going to ask, but I, I decided not to prepare that, but I will, I will do it now. All right, the notes say, and I'm very hope, I'm, I'm hoping very much that I'm in shot here. Um, I'm just gonna, the notes say this. Now I believe they've informed you're going to get the Fourier transform table which doesn't tell you what any particular functions Fourier transform is, but it does tell you this, this thing. No, I want to zoom in, you stupid machine. Oh, damn it. There. No. That thing. Okay, so I'm going to write that down on my piece of paper so that I don't lose it. All right. This is what the notes say Fourier transform is. So um, what feels like months ago, we, uh, and probably was actually, did Laplace, no, anyway, feels like a long time ago, did Laplace transforms, which were also defined in terms of integrals. Um, and they also had e to the things but the Fourier transform um, is different to that for um, the most obvious reason that we have the number i in it. We beautiful and, and um, much maligned um, imaginary identity. So, um, yeah, and there are reasons for this. It's apparently easier. So, than what, than what we could have done, which apparently would be harder. Um, and uh, and you can I mean you can look up Fourier transform videos online all you like, um, and there'll be wonderful animations of spinning circles and things with spikes in some sort of auditory 
thing and they figure out what the sounds are that make up stuff. And it's all very fun and cool. This feels less so. <laughs> Just. But it's a bit like going to open day at university and you go to the chemistry place and they make like elephant toothpaste or something. Oh, that's so cool. And then your first prac is weighing water, right? It's a, um, yeah, so it's similar to that. So there are things about it. I've never studied differential equations. I don't really know how it's connected to those other things. I do know that complex numbers, um, we pretend that things in electronics are about complex numbers. It's a handy way of wrapping up our signs and causes together. Um, and the beautiful thing about complex numbers is they're just numbers. And so we can do integrals the same way as we do um, other things. I'm just gonna plug my computer in before it gives up on me. The other day in the Mass Learning Center, the Zoom session had been plugged in, but nobody turned it on. And so it turned off in the middle of talking to a student. And that's my life, plugging things in. All right. So, um, cool. So I want to compare some things. Comparing this to the Laplace transform. Let's see if I can remember the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform of a function um, of time was Is that right? Is there something else out the front? I'm gonna to have to look it up, aren't I? Oh, I was right. My memory is, is working well. So the reason I'm doing this is that um, the sensation of understanding is about the connections between things in your brain, literally, like your brain cells send out dendrites and connect to each other. And so um, you will feel that you understand something the more things that it is connected to. Sometimes it helps to connect it to movies you've watched and sometimes it helps to connect the bits of math to each other. So the first thing I wanna do is compare it to other things. So I can see how these are similar and how they're different. So firstly, our Fourier transform takes functions of X and produces functions of W. I believe officially it's an omega, but I'm gonna keep calling it W. Um, whereas our Laplace transform takes functions of time and produces functions of S. Officially, the maths doesn't know that the T stands for time, like the integral doesn't know that the T stands for time. So you can use Laplace transforms on whatever variables you want. It's just that it's tradition to use them in situations where the T represents time. And it's tradition to represent Fourier transforms in some situations where the X represents um, distance, but it can also represent other things like time or frequency or other things. Okay. The Amiga though does represent um, frequency. Um, in that context, because we're trying to figure out signs and causes, like sine of omega x, that sort of thing. Okay, so they both have got an e to the minus something in them. But in this one, it's not e to the minus wx, like this one's a minus st, so the x goes in the spot where the t is. Instead of just s, we've got i times w. So a major difference is this one's got the i. And other major difference, this one starts at zero and goes to infinity. This one goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's important to notice those differences so that when you write them down, you go, oh yes, I, because they're so similar to each other, if you don't notice the differences, you're likely to mix them up at an important time. So that's just what I wanted to point out. Um, and this one's got this one over two pi thing. This one doesn't. I should warn you that if you Google Fourier transform, it will not, the formula will be different in different, on different websites, different at different universities, 
And it might even be that if you do Fourier transforms over in physics, the formula will be different than the way it is in maths. Warning you now. <laughs> so in some places it won't have a one on two pi here. Some places it will. Okay, just a warning. So really important thing about Laplace transforms is it technically only applies to functions that start at zero. Um, this function t of t here technically doesn't exist when t is negative. Even if the function itself could be subbed in negative numbers, you don't sub in negative numbers. And one of the reasons it keeps producing that u thing, the u of t or the u of t minus whatever, is because when you shift a function that doesn't exist before zero forwards, there's a gap before it begins. And so it's zero up to a certain spot. So that's the reason why the u is there. Whereas this function is not gonna do the same thing. It's defined for functions that go, that are defined everywhere. You're gonna do the integral from minus infinity to infinity. But I warn you that the u's will still appear because many functions, even though they're defined from minus infinity to infinity, are really only defined from um, minus five to five, like in the most recent Mobius. Okay. The other difference between the Fourier transforms and the Laplace transforms from a, from a exam point of view is that the, the Fourier transform table does not tell you what the Fourier transform of any function is. Whereas the Laplace transform table is a list of what the Laplace transform is for various functions. So that means that the way that they're going to get you to behave when doing things with Fourier transforms is going to be different to Laplace transforms. You're going to be able to do more stuff with a Laplace transform in an exam than you would with a Fourier transform. Because a Fourier transform, you only, your only choice is to do it using the integral, which it takes longer. Whereas a Laplace transform, you're almost never gonna do it with the integral using the original definition. You're just going to say, this is the answer because the table says so. Um, that just tells me that it's much more likely to have a complicated question involving Laplace transforms in the exam than it is to have a, a, long, like a question that looks long involving Fourier transforms. That's my... It will still take a long time because you have to do the integral, but it just won't look as long. Okay, that's just my instinct. Last comparison is between these two. They are exactly the same, almost identical. The forward transform that goes from X to W has a minus, and the one that goes from W to X doesn't have a minus. Also, this one has a DX. You start with X, you do a DX, and you finish with a W. This one, you start with W and you do a DW and you finish with an X. Because this is a definite integral, right? Whatever X is, is going to be replaced by numbers. And so there won't be any X's at the end, but there will be W's. Because this is a different integral for every W, slightly different. If W was three, you'd do the integral and you'd get an answer. If W was four, you'd get an integral and you get an answer. And those answers are what F hat comes out to. Stop there. How are people feeling? All right. Let's do one. Okay. Uh, Let's do that one. I just want to try it, to see what happens. So that would be a function of W. I'll actually, just a second, let's call f of x equals e to the x and do the Fourier transform of f of x. And so this will be f hat of W and it will be one over root 2 pi, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the x 
e to the minus i w x dw dx. See, I always do it wrong. And that's why I have to go back and check. This is probably not going to work, but I just wanted to try it. So that's a wx plus x just there, because multiplication between the e's is addition at the top. If you trusted your arithmetic more than I do, um, or algebra more than I do, you would be able to do this in one step, but um, I don't trust myself that much. Just that. Cool. And I know how to integrate um, e to the x. If this was a, just a plain old number, I would go, the integral would be the same times that number, and I would divide by that number. Because that's how you do the integral of e to the something times x, because of the chain rule in reverse. And this is a number. I just want to remind myself, since the x's are gone, that what I'm subbing in is x. I can't write x equals minus infinity. But I just want to remind myself that I'm subbing x's in, not w's, or I'll do it wrong. Um, OK. I do not like it, Sam, I am. This is, this is bad. Now what? I feel like this isn't going to exist. All right. And that's not an x, it's a 2 pi. What the hell am I doing? I do see that um, this is inside here. It doesn't have an x in it, so I'm going to bring that out as well. And I might separate out those e to the x's again. Now I give up at this point. I just, I can, no. It seems to me that um, one of these ends isn't going to exist. Like if you're going to minus infinity, e to the minus infinity is zero, but e to the plus infinity is, well, infinity. Um, and so at this stage, I would probably have to split that e to the i w um, into, yeah, that's what, into a cos and a sine, wouldn't I? Yeah, I choose not to do any more. Sorry, this is the problem. I choose to stop. Okay, if you're in your exam, it's actually not a bad thing to do that <laughs> and not waste your time on something that isn't gonna go anywhere. Hopefully the one they choose in your exam is gonna be possible. I don't have enough experience with this. But I will do one that was in one of the assignments, which I liked, which was doing an inverse Fourier transform. Which is this. So this function, just to be clear what this function is doing, this function, um, that function is the unit step function. It's zero 
up until the point where this is a positive number and then it's one after that. So, and this function is zero up to when this is a positive number and then it's one after that. So this, this number inside becomes positive when w is three. That's when it's, if, when w is less than three, then I get a negative thing in here. And so u of negative is zero. And when w is more than three, I get a positive number and u of positive number is one. And so when I see u of w minus thing or x minus thing or t minus thing, it means that it turns into the number one when you pass this number. And this turns into the number one when I pass the number minus three. So it's zero up until this point, and then it becomes one. And then I keep going. And this has been zero this entire time because this number is zero all the way up to, this function is zero all the way up to three. And so at this point, this starts being a one, but I take it off so it comes back down again. So this thing is how you write a function that is one in this zone and zero everywhere else. So the Fourier inverse Yep, just a second. Curly top, curly tail, cross. Okay. So I, I think that's a good curly F, do you reckon? Yeah. <laughs> I can do a curly L. It took me years to learn how to do that, and I'm very proud of it. Um, but, uh, yeah. I had lots of curly letters in my PhD thesis. I, I practice a lot. Okay, but didn't have any curly Fs, mainly because I didn't know how to write them. I mean, the, the computer knows how to write them, but, you know, not when doing a seminar. Um, anyway, so F inverse of F hat W, according to the rules, it's the same integral as you would do for the other one. And you put F hat W in this spot and you do E to the I W X D W because I'm starting with a W and I don't want Ws at the end, so I need to sub numbers in for W, so it's a DW. And the forward one is a minus, so the backwards one is a plus. Okay. All right. And so this is that function in this spot just here. This function is zero in this zone just here. And when I do the definite integral of a function that is zero, it's the area and the area is zero. So the answer is zero. And it's zero over here as well. And in this zone, it's a one. And so this integral is going to be just the integral from minus three to three of the number one, because that's what the function is between that zone. Magic. Being an exponential, um, I will divide by the constant, and the constant today is ix. Because there's a dw, the w counts as a variable, and the x counts as a constant. And I did dw, so I'm subbing in w is minus 3 and w is 3. Just to remind myself what I'm subbing in or I'll end up with a w at the end and I need to end up with an x at the end because I started with a w and need to finish with an x. You can see all these little things that I do for myself to stop myself from being wrong. Um, they're good things to remind yourself. Things that you're likely to make a mistake in, find a way of avoiding making the mistake. Okay. So I can pull out the, the on ix because it's just a number. And I'll get um, e to the i times 3x minus, uh, plus, no, minus because it's an integral, e to the i times minus 3x. Cool. Nothing up my sleeve. Ready? Ready? This, this is really cool. I love it so much. I know that e to the i theta 
is cos theta plus i sine theta. And I know that e to the minus i theta is cos of minus theta, and because cos is even, that's the same as cos of theta, and plus i sine of minus theta, and because sine is odd, that's minus i sine of theta. And if I add them to, if I subtract them and have this minus this, so this minus this is this minus this, which is zero, and this minus minus this, which is two of them. Oh, <gasps> yay. Um, and so this thing here is half, is two I sine theta. So I had the one on two pi before, I had a one on I X, and then I have two I sine theta. And I is just a number, it's on the top and the bottom, they cancel, that's great. So I've got two on root two pi sine. It's not a theta, damn it. What's my theta? My theta is three X. Cool. Three, no, X. Yep, that's the theta there, three X. Sweet. Ta-da, answer. So the inverse Laplace trans Fourier transform of the U function is this. Yay. Um, I will do one last thing. Those twos both being there looks messy and I reckon I can simplify that. No, let me bring it under the square root. Yeah, let's do that. So this root, this two is the square root of four and square roots um, expand out and factorize over division. And so, and that becomes a root two on pi. And that is why the Mobius is a full of root two on pi's. Yeah. I thought I'd do it now. Yes. Are you using a factor of one in x? Oh, I totally am. Thank you. Yes, I got the X. Worth checking, <laughs> that sort of thing. Every time I do a revision seminar and someone points that out, I go, wouldn't you like someone looking over your shoulder checking that you'd missed things during your exam? In the film um, Barbie Princess Charm School, um, they have um, fairy helpers, um, every student, um, and I think that would be a useful thing, as long as my fairy helper knew Fourier transforms. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, would anyone like to? Um, are there any moves I made there that people think were cool or useful? Pick one. <laughs> Personally, I love this move. And that was what that Mobius question was about, basically, that move. Yeah. Well, I was only doing just this, but in the one in the Mobius, there was also there was also this times W. And that becomes, when you do the Fourier transform of that, inverse Fourier transform of this thing, you get of W. And uh, we have to do integration by parts, sadly. Um, but what ends up happening is that that W is a minus three and a plus three and the minus three cancels out this minus and you end up with an E to the thing plus E to the minus thing 
And so you end up with the cos version of that, um, of this thing. Because when you add these together, you get two cos theta. Yeah. This is a silly, um, one of my silly little moves is just um, cancelling the eyes. So many people who do complex numbers and have seen them before go, am I allowed to do that? And you are. It really is just a number. I mean, it's not just a number, but um, it's no more special than one is special. Um, it's much less special than one, actually. Um, so just treat it as a variable. Do division in whenever you like. You're allowed to divide by i. It is definitely not zero, so you're allowed to divide by it. Um, that's different from dividing by x. Um, and so, yeah, that's that. Um, the only other thing with the Fourier transform is that apparently there is one rule that you definitely know about Fourier transforms. Laplace transforms, um, if you know what f of x f t is, then the Laplace transform of f dashed of t is s f of s minus f of zero. That's how Laplace transforms interact with derivatives. Fourier transforms, if you know the Fourier transform of f of x is f hat of w, then the Fourier transform of f dashed of x will be i w f hat of w. Is that the right rule? I think so. Um, that's the only one of these rules that I know to be sure true. Um, I'm sure there are other rules. Cool. I do want to say one last thing while we're on the topic of transforms. Um, the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform create a new thing that is like a function but isn't a function. So it's supposed to be something that turns functions into other functions. Like you go functions of t turn into functions of s or functions of x turn into functions of w. Um, but in a technical sense, the things that you do Laplace and Fourier transforms on don't have to be functions. They just have to be things that have integrals. And there is one extra object that is created through this process that isn't a function but does have an integral. And it's called the Dirac delta function. I just wanted to mention it. The Dirac delta function isn't a function. It's, I don't even know what it's called. There's a word for it. Sorry? Because it was named before people decided what functions really were. Right. <laughs> so we're calling it a function. It is a, a, a what, in what my parents would have called a Clayton's function. A function you have when you don't have a function. <laughs> um, it's nearly a function. It has the property that its answer is, if, if you treat it as a function, the answer is almost always zero. All right. So it's, and in the notes they say, in inverted commas, equals, for a certain value of equal, it's zero whenever x isn't zero. And it's like infinity when x is zero. That's why it's not a function, because it produces something that isn't a number. Okay. And that's not at all helpful. The point of the Dirac delta function is this. If you do the integral of the Dirac delta function from like minus 10 to minus 2, you will get 0. And this will be true for any zone that is completely negative. And if you do the Dirac de integral of the Dirac delta function from like, you know, uh, 2.8 to 57, you'll get zero. 
And that will be true for any interval that is completely positive. But if you do the integral of the Dirac delta function from somewhere negative to somewhere positive, the answer will be one. No matter how wide the interval is, if it crosses from negative to positive, the integral of the Dirac delta function on that zone will be one. Um, this is the logic behind that. The Dirac delta function is, well, it wasn't designed to do this. The Dirac delta function is used, it wasn't designed for this, but it does this um, in the same way that the cross product does some things it wasn't designed to do, um, but it does them anyway. Um, the Dirac delta function was, is, is used to model something that happens extremely suddenly. You have a very, if two objects in space collide, then the one will transfer force to the other. But they might only be in contact for a fraction of a second. And so that force, that, that momentum that's transferred has to happen instantly. Um, and that's what the Dirac delta function is trying to get at. Okay. So, and the, the, the idea behind it is that I can have a function whose integral is one, whose integral is mostly zero on most intervals and is one on some intervals and is mostly zero on others. And it would be a function like this that goes from minus just a little bit to plus one. And if the height here, so what's that? That's 0.2 wide. And so if I um, had five as the height, then the integral would be one. As long as I crossed from here to here. So if I had any interval that was in this zone, the area would be zero. Any interval in this zone, the area would be zero. And any interval that crossed all of this, the integral would be one. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it thinner and taller and thinner and taller and thinner and taller, maintaining the area at one um, always. Yep. So the quotation marks for infinity x, y, and zero there? Yep. Whatever that means. Um, so, but what we do is we don't worry about it. <laughs> just go, no. don't like it. Just gonna put it over here, leave it there and not look at it. It's okay. <laughs> All right, so um, the Laplace transform, it, the Laplace transform only has to, will, will be able to work on anything that has an integral. And if I define this object Integration is something that we used to do to functions. And now we're gonna say integration is allowed to apply to some other things that are not quite, almost, but not quite functions. And that's what this is. Yeah. And so when I do the Laplace transform of the Dirac, the Fourier transform of the Dirac delta function, it will be one on root two pi of the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the Dirac delta function times e to the i dx. This function is mostly zero. I mean, function. And the integral from minus anywhere to plus anywhere of just this would be one. Um, and so it's going to turn out to be e to the i times zero. Yep. Which is just one on root two pi. I think I'm wrong. Could be wrong. 
Right. Ah, oh, that's the other thing the direct filter function does. Uh, just give me a second. I did look it up just a sec. One moment. This is still only a couple of years new to me. So your teachers are supposed to be able to um, pass on the wealth of their experience. I do not have a great wealth of experience. Oh, it should be back in Fourier, shouldn't it? No. I was sure we had the Dirac in here somewhere. I was wrong. Okay, it's okay. Um, I'm pretty sure. There is a property of the Dirac function, uh, which is um, one moment. It'll only take me a second. Ah, right, here it is. There is a property of the Dirac delta function which says that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the Dirac delta function of t minus a times g of t dt is g of a. I did get it right. Yes, it will be this function applied at zero. Okay, this is the rule. And my a is zero and my g is this function. And my t is x. <laughs> no, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's because uh, when you look at it, there's a width and a height and they sort of cancel each other out. I'm sure I could do it properly. But this is the other thing that the Dirac delta function does. You mostly multiply this function by zero and so you only end up with a single answer, which is the function value at the spot where the direct delta function does its thing. All right, I don't want to do any more than that. I'll put this over here, leave it there. Every so often ask it what the answer is. Okay, that's enough. Uh, final questions or thoughts? Right. Thank you um, for being here and uh, allowing me to um, talk crap at you.